But I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, um, deep learning um, in, 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 in various ways. So basically, um, my, back, my background is in computer science. Um, then I moved into economics and finance. And, uh, and we did uh, what, what I guess could be called deep learning um, already around, around 10 years back. And I'm sure there are several in this room that, that have done deep learning much, much before that. So it's, it's really nothing new. And, and, uh, um, and basically what I will be, will be doing now is that I'll, I'll take you through a few cases where we've been sort of doing research. And the way that we work is that we basically publish everything that we do um, and, uh, and then we try to move, move into products through uh, uh, um, industry work and in infolytic ventures, and, and, and that involves mainly consulting work. Um, and a few of those cases I'll take you through, especially with, with central banks and, and how, how our models relate to that. Um, so what, what basically my background and my interest has been in, in, in measuring vulnerability. And this is not to say that, that, that we can predict the, the date of a financial crisis or a, a stress event. What we say is that we can measure vulnerability when we, we can measure when you are vulnerable to shocks that trigger stress events. Uh, we don't know precisely when these shocks happen and what the next shock is, but what, do we, what we do know, and there's plenty of historical evidence for this, is um, uh, how, how likely or how, how vulnerable uh, uh, you are to, to certain types of shocks. And this, this then relates to, to uh, uh, sort of standard deep learning algorithms, as you would understand today, related to text, uh, but also sort of standard um, machine learning toolboxes um, that we're uh, uh, applying on numerical data to, to standard classification problems. So I'll, Basically, we have three cases uh, uh, now coming up, and I'll, I'll try to be brief on these, and then we can have a few follow de more detailed follow-up questions on the modeling techniques here, and I'll try to take you through the, the basically the results of some of our in industry work there. But we focus on, on in metrics, we focus on measuring what we call interconnected risk, uh, uh, measuring risk in interconnected financial systems. Uh, in SiloBrain, uh, we've, we're working on, on basically visualization dashboards where we are joining visual processes and social processes. So we are essentially focusing on capturing interaction among humans uh, rather than only looking at interaction between the human and the computer. And uh, uh, Almax Analytics, uh, um, which is pure deep learning from our side, it's an event-based trading system uh, where we are plugging in certain deep learning algorithms. Uh, so with Netrix, um, our objective is to come up with a standardized risk rating for interconnected financial systems. It's obviously a, a, a interconnected risk in general is, is, is complex, hard to quantify, and there is no sort of standard for measuring uh, system-wide impact in, in interconnected systems. And, this could be an example. So this is an example that we normally look at where we have banking systems as nodes and linkages across banking systems um, uh, defined by, by exposures uh, across, across the, the, the nodes. And essentially what we're looking at here is a four-dimensional data cube. So um, if we forget linkages and networks, um, we have a standard three-dimensional data cube. So basically we have uh, on, on the y-axis here, we have entities that could be countries, banking systems, or that could be banks. Um, here we have time that could be high frequency data, but it could also be annual data, depending on what we're looking at. And then we have variables. Uh, it could be credit gap. It could be um, various indicators, uh, depending on then whether we're looking at banks or countries and so forth. Now the fourth dimension that we're adding to this is, is the the linkages here, so we're not only concerned in sort of crunching this three-dimensional data cube from several, say, risk indicators into a number, but we'll, we're also concerned in aggregating this number um, based upon how these entities are interconnected. Um, and and this, is, this is partly related to work that we did with, with ECB uh, uh, some time ago. So, so this here is a bank level early warning model. So it's a, 
in a sense a predictive model, but basically what it's doing is that it's measuring vulnerability in the, in this case, Eura area banking system. However, it's a bank level model, so you have, you have granular output, you have output at the bank level. Um, and uh, um, so, so here you have granular output. Here you have output at the bank level. And basically what you can see here on the y-axis is distress probability. So this is measuring vulnerability at the bank level. You have the top, I think, top 20 banks here. And this exercise is a pre-comprehensive assessment exercise. So at this point I was with the ECB. Um, and we were building a, 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 an early warning model simultaneously with the comprehensive assessment. The comprehensive assessment included, I think, around 9,000 uh, uh, supervisors. So it was manual labor. Um, this model included two guys on the side of a few other things. And basically what you can see here is um, uh, with pre-comprehensive assessment data, so the same data that was used in the, pre in the comprehensive assessment, um, how well the model basically maps uh, to the outcome of, of the comprehensive assessment. Now, this is not to say that, that we could have done as well as the comprehensive assessment, but we are not far off uh, with, with the model. And then we are not at that point even taking into account any type of interconnectedness. So that's based upon individual data. So it's based on balance sheet, income statement, and market prices for these entities. And what we, we've then done in a, in, a, in a recent paper, and we've done some empirical work before that, this is a mathematical model, but empirical work before that showing that obviously we should write um, the vulnerability of a bank as a function of also its neighbors, right? So that's basically what we are doing here. So you have a decomposable measure that accounts for individual effects of bank C, direct effects of bank I on bank C, and indirect effects of bank J via bank I on bank C, right? That's fairly obvious. Then the nice thing is that it's really decomposable, so we have these measures decomposed. The other thing is that we can go through, this is a two additive case, so we have basically decomposed into two different types of effects. We can do a K additive case, add up, and we can do dynamic iteration, so we, we can simulate with this as, as well. Um, and to give you intuition what this means, let's say if we look at the, at the country level um, on imbalance, uh, on a, an early warning model. So this is based upon imbalance indicators uh, for Germany and a set of other, other countries that we are using for learning. But essentially here, the blue part looks at individual risk. It's basically for Germany, it means that uh, uh, this much vulnerability descends from uh, the indicate indicators of Germany, right? Now, this is what a German policymaker would agree with. They, said, they would say that they had an imported crisis, so you should not even find vulnerability in domestic indicators here. Um, and that's precisely what you find when you account for direct effects, because when you also account for the vulnerability of the countries that the German banking sector was exposed to, then you add up the red component, which would be Southern Europe in this case, and the States. And we have pl plenty of empirical evidence that shows that if you account for these linkages, then you improve performance. So this is basically how we move to, um, how we move to not only accounting for, for node vulnerability, but also for accounting, uh, uh, also accounting for, for vulnerability in, in a, 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 um, an interconnected system. So from a machine learning perspective, basically what we're doing is a two class classification problem. We have two class classifiers and what we have on top of that is network aggregation. Um, I would not, not say this is very deep learning, but I mean, what this essentially is, is ensemble learning. It's based upon a very large number of different models. Um, and uh, uh, we have a web interface to interact with methods and the exercises, and this is something that we've worked with central banks uh, already for around five years or so. And there is a public version which relates to one of our papers, so if you want to have a look, you can have a look over there. So the second project basically is related to um, a, a research project funded by the SWIFT uh, in 2013. Um, 
that, uh, with, within that project, we built an interactive visualization platform. Um, and the idea with that was to basically run an awareness project where we were putting systemic risk models and data side by side in order to better understand the models themselves and in order to be able to compare um, existing models and data with each other. You have a large number of models measuring the same thing, uh, um, but giving quite different output. And, uh, uh, and I guess this relates quite well to uh, uh, Petros' Sirto uh, uh, project measuring systemic risk. So, so this, uh, um, this then um, turned into a sort of general purpose infrastructure for setting up especially uh, interactive network visualization for network analytics. And with this, we, we, we worked with several central banks and several banks with this infrastructure, setting up ad hoc dashboards, um, especially around, around network data. And again, you, you find uh, certain showcases that are online publicly available, like crisismetrics.com. Um, but this, the idea behind this, obviously, is that we want not only to rely on artificial intelligence, but also to rely on human intelligence. We want to rely on, on the human visual system as an, an, in its own way as an efficient processor of information. Now, now the, the question then is, we, how should we together analyze data if we are a sort of data-driven community and looking at the same problem? And what we've been working on before this is only, involves only interaction between one analyst and one screen, like this. Um, and and this, what, what, where we want to get now is, is much more than just collaborative. So say the accountant that, that spots an irregularity in a graph of retail sales then, then confers with a colleague shows it to a lawyer and present it, presents it to a jury. And this is a strange example. Um, collaboration here is not really the problem. You can send around emails. You can even print this on paper and show it to these guys. Um, the question is, how are you capturing the knowledge of these people on the way and storing that, structuring that? And that's where we are basically not doing artificial intelligence, but intelligence augmentation by combining visual and social processes. Um, because we know that there is a large role for human experts in, in data-driven organizations. Uh, analytics relies on, on um, our visual abilities to a large extent because we do rely on visualization, but not so much on social abilities. And we are not facilitating human interaction documenting it and structuring it. So essentially, what we want to do is annotatable visualization dashboards. What we're already doing is vis annotatable visualization dashboards, where we are basically linking expert discussion to the data. Uh, we don't see silos as a bad thing in that sense. Silos um, are just a way to connect the organization with the work of the analyst. Uh, Silo 2.0 is highly interconnected. It's just one place where you are connected. Um, and that's where you are managing soft and hard knowledge in one accessible place. So I'm not sure whether this really shows to the back, but this, this is, a, um, this is a, a, an early version of, of um, and an example of an interactive chart where uh, you have sort of full possibilities to zoom, pan, filter, and all of that uh, as you normally do with, with interactive charts, but also um, the capability of annotating data points. So the data cube that you saw in the beginning, you are now just tagging and linking your expert knowledge to that, which in the background builds uh, a wiki and a feed where you are basically not only following people, but also following data, and essentially uh, um, building a, a, a knowledge base of, of your organization. Okay, the final part um, relates more directly to deep learning. Um, and this, this was a research project that we, where we focused on, on, um, we focused on event extraction in, um, with a, a large supervisor 
um, in Europe, looking at, uh, looking at around five, five 6,000 banks um, across Europe. Um, and what we basically built for them was a, a deep learning approach that detected distress events or elevated stress levels for banks um, based upon news data and then provided automated descriptions for these events. Um, and that was at the keyword level, at text snippet level, and at document level, at, at news uh, or article level. Um, so essentially, it's, it's, it's a fairly, at the beginning it was a fairly standard, now we've moved a bit forward, but I'll come to that soon. But at the beginning it was a fairly standard algorithm. We, we did a, a sort of, doc to vec type of a transformation from, uh, from uh, uh, textual uh, vectors to, to, to word, uh, to, to numerical vectors, which gave us the semantic vectors that we then use in a supervised way um, to learn a distress signal for individual banks. And that basically functioned as an alert system to look at banks that have stress-related discussion. It doesn't mean that we're predicting with this. It means that we are basically pointing out where we have stress-related discussion. But what that means is that you don't have to follow the news for 5,000 banks, but instead, basically, you can look at the basically places where we are pointing with this. And you already get an understanding when you get the keywords, the text snippets, and the articles that are top-ranked in terms of stress levels. <coughs> so here you basically see uh, um, these are percentile distributions of the stress score in Europe. So for all banks, all articles, um, how, how that evolved over time. The, the darkest line here is the mean of the stress score, um, giving an understanding of how stress-related discussion has evolved over time. Um, and now this relates uh, directly to Almax Analytics, which is an event, in a sense, can be used as an event event-based trading system. Now the difference is that the events are not distress events, but the events are, um, um, let's say, let's generalize. The events can be anything, basically any binary events that you can predefine. So say um, um, for a certain stock, they could be new projects, mergers and acquisitions and so forth. Now Almax um, has, um, basically launched yesterday and is, is based, based upon a, a very powerful event extraction engine that is to a large extent rule-based. But we are component by component replacing with data-driven uh, uh, approaches. And that's where we are also plugging in uh, uh, some of these deep learning approaches and improving on them. So for instance, one way that, that we've improved this lately is that we are not only incorporating textual data here, but we're also incorporating numerical data. So in a bank case, you would have the fundamentals coming in here as well. So it's basically understanding the document in the context of the fundamentals for the bank at the same time. Um, okay, uh, so a final, final, um, uh, uh, Shameless marketing is that we are organizing in, in uh, Helsinki a uh, conference on systemic risk analytics. Um, lots of similar um, approaches covered um, with the Bank of Finland, with the European Systemic Risk Board, which is under the ECB. And uh, then we're also organizing an executive fintech education with actually several speakers coming from, from London um, and, and a large extent, if not most, coming from abroad. Okay, thank you very much.